Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. From wherever you are, happy to see that you are choosing to be with us. My name is Goni and I'm part of the NVC Rising team. And slowly, slowly, people are joining us and are expected to join us in the next five to 10 minutes. Sometimes even people join us after one hour. So welcome, everyone. Welcoming you to rename yourself in case you wish um, with uh, mentioning where you are um, connecting us from, where are you on the globe? We are here in the session that will be facilitated by trainer Tarek Masarani. And that is, uh, we call it uh, the role of NBC in times of war. It seems to me and us and at NBC Rising um, like something we would like to, to talk about, to open, to explore together, especially in these times. Personally, I'm located in Israel and Palestine, and we are in times of war. For 70, for 70 years, but mostly also now. Um, yeah, so um, we decided um, to, to ask Tarek, to invite Tarek to lead this session, and Tarek will share more about his experience uh, over the years, and you might be able to understand why we approached him after you hear a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I know Tarek for, for many years, we've been doing different projects together around uh, the practice of NVC and in the context of conflict also. Um, so I will leave most of it for Tarek. Um, one, two things that I would like to say before we actually start, before we open. Um, I would like to thank Army for being our tech person for today. So thank you, Army. Um, and I would also like to share that uh, we at NVC Rising in less than a week from now are going to open our year program that we called the Learning Community. It's going to be the third year for us to run the Learning Community. It's a 10-month journey uh, into NVC, a deep dive uh, to the practice of NVC that we are going through uh, together in, in a global community online. If you are curious to hear more about it, I welcome you to, um, to stay for a few minutes after the session will be completed, after the session is over and I can say a bit more about it. I might also put the link to the program in the chat now in the beginning of the session. And I also would like to share that in a few days from now, on Tuesday, we are going to have another free community session that is called Embodied Empathy, Embodied Empathy. And it's about the intersection uh, between NBC, nonviolent communication, and playback theater. So it's a totally different direction from today, and I welcome you to join this free event. Um, and that's about it. So Tarek, thank you so much for being here with us today and leading this session. And I am passing the mic to you. Thank you. Thank you, Goni. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Um, just looking at all the faces on the screens here. Um, yeah. Imagining where everyone might be coming in, calling in from where this might find you, what time zone you're in, what mood you might be in. Um, uh, curious about where you're coming from, curious what brings you here. Um, and very much honored to have <clears throat> some 50 people, 50 plus people here, uh, interested to, to think together uh, about uh, this particular topic of NVC and, and war. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm going to give you a bit of a rundown of what I have planned for the next two hours. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by by sharing a bit more about me um, uh, as both a way of 
uh, of building connection to this uh, to this session and to this the process of the session uh, of kind of framing the topic that we have. Um, I'd like to offer uh, some some opportunity for uh, folks on this call to connect with each other um, uh, to bring yourselves into a sense of community here on this short call. Um, after that, um, I've got some words I want to share, just some initial thoughts about the topic, um, particularly about war, uh, and some discussion I'd like to open up on those. Um, then, then we'll be kind of switching between um, some breakout groups uh, that explore our personal connection to nonviolent communication and to war, and some larger group discussion on those particular connections. Um, so, uh, and not totally sure how this will end because I imagine that there's going to be a lot of emergent that comes from from that small group to large group dynamic um, that might take us in various different directions. Um, so that's uh, what we've got planned. Um, so I'll start with myself. Uh, I've been practicing NBC uh, for officially, I'd say formally, uh, for 17 or so years uh, since I was first introduced. And I've had the opportunity um, to gain experience both training and facilitating in NVC as, as a form of peace building process, as well as uh, in the context of anti-war activism uh, in a variety of different contexts, uh, including, including the Middle East. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm also a professor uh, of justice and peace studies. Um, I've I've taught at a numerous different universities, but my primary affiliation nowadays is the uh, is Georgetown University. Um, I have background educationally in international law as a as a as a, a, a Georgetown uh, student and then a practicing attorney, um, including in human rights law, and also as a as a student of international relations. Um, and Columbia University, another grad degree I picked up. Um, more personal and and possibly and I think more influential um, is my family background. Um, so my mother's mother fled Germany in the 1930s as a young Jewish girl, um, while my father's mother uh, lived through the hard years of World War II as a German civilian. A generation later, uh, my mother and family uh, lived out the first decade of the Civil War in Lebanon and then before coming to the U.S. during the second decade of the, the Civil War. And on my father's side, I was separated from him on opposite sides of the Iron Curtain of the so-called Cold War. Um, for me, October 7th uh, was my 45th birthday. I spent that day uh, reaching out to family and friends in Lebanon, Israel, Gaza, uh, figuring out how to get my mother-in-law out of the West Bank, um, where she was with her extended family. As with many of us, I have been experiencing a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions, anxiety, sleepless nights, nightmares, flooding and numbness, hope and despair, grief and rage. I've gotten a lot of practice learning to move from hopelessness and helplessness uh, to purposeful action during these times. And in part, that's um, a motivation I have uh, for accepting the rather difficult task of talking about NVC during these times. Uh, presumably, uh, those in this session here have some exposure to NVC, although it's not a prerequisite. Presumably and sadly, I, I take that all of us have some distant or close experience of war. Um, many of us uh, may be highly impacted by the recent events in Israel and Palestine, including our organizers, uh, which has inspired us to hold this session. 
I want to acknowledge the extraordinary pain and upheaval of these times. I also want to recognize the less visible conflicts across the world, uh, conflicts that take lives and livelihoods as if they were cheap and disposable. I want to honor each of you here, whatever journey you are on. I welcome you to be here in solidarity with each other as humans, regardless of how you have arrived. If you find yourself freezing, panicked, uh, or enraged during our time together, please step away from the session. Please leave the breakout group. Take care of yourself. I ask all, us all to respect and celebrate others' decisions to disconnect in that way. Consider requesting empathy support if and when you need it. If uh, you think you'll hold a capacity throughout the, the session to, so, to provide empathy support, then please add Empathy Angel to your name so we can see it online. That said, um, there will only be limited opportunity for deep processing. This particular platform and the numbers of peoples we're talking about is not well suited for it. Um, I encourage you strongly with whatever comes up here or has been coming up for you that you find more suitable spaces for support. So we're gonna start with our first breakout group. We're gonna have you go out in groups of three and um, this is meant as our first breakout group, really just to get you connected with each other. Uh, it is not meant uh, to have you dive into the topic of our session today. So I ask you to refrain from talking about uh, war and, and instead to introduce yourself, your name, where you're coming from. And in the spirit of a holiday that we've just celebrated in the United States, something that you are grateful for. So in your breakout groups of three, uh, introduce your name, where in the world you are, and something that you're grateful for. You have 10 minutes, so divide your time, approximately three minutes each, but feel free to be flexible. Uh, we'll give you a heads up when it's time to return to the whole group. Thank you. I see we have Anne here and someone coming from, I like dialing from a number, like a phone number, and Luis. So maybe they can all go to, to a breakout room, the three of them. Shall we tell them what they're going to do in a breakout room? Ah, yeah. Did, mm -hmm. Maybe Tarek, you can repeat before we, we send. Yeah. So maybe the four people who are here can, oh, Roberta is here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's, a, it's a time to connect with each other um, by sharing your name, where you're calling in from, uh, and what is something you're grateful for. Um, and if you have extra time, feel free to keep chatting. We're not diving into the topic of the call yet. Hi, Roberta. Mm -hmm. Hey, Roberta. Roberta and Jessica. Hey, hey, Jessica. You're going to be with us, I think, in the learning community, right? <laughs> it's yeah. you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, um, my niece, Kristen, is coming, Tarek. Mm. Um, okay, well, we have a, <laughs> we have people joining now exactly in the time of the breakouts. So maybe Tarek, we will, uh, we will do it once again, because at least three more people joined <laughs> since you. Could you just add a room for us, please? Yeah, yeah. I think Ami is working on it. Thank you. Uh, it might be Ami that, um, 
We don't have a spare room. We, I did, a, I oh, did a lot okay. of, of spare room. Ah, you did. Okay. Just a That's matter it. of putting them in a. Um, okay. Hmm. So, okay. Tak, will you repeat it once again? I know that's oh, here. There's another person coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for those that let's wait till Morton gets in. Yeah. Okay. I, although I think Morton already heard us. Uh, okay. Because I think they were so, here before, but okay. Great. For those who just joined, we are uh, hey, breakout great. groups for some for some uh, uh, so for warm up connection for us to to be in space together, not to dive into the topic of of the session, but rather to share your name, your location, and something that you're grateful for, um, and anything else that the conversation might uh, uh, might flow to. Amy, would you like me to help? Uh, um, if you can, if it will be um, more efficient to do that. Because um, I see Anne is still here. <laughs> oh, now she's now she's here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, actually, I see that Anne, you were assigned. Do do you see like a something calling you to join a room? Looks like you were assigned. Present, but not yet. Or maybe it took me out because my connection was flagging for a moment. So, Christine, I will put you on 16. And then I will put April to on 16. Mm -hmm. So maybe we put also Anne in 16, if possible. I, I can see her in the Anne assigned list. So I wonder... It looks like she she is assigned somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Anne, can you can you leave and come back just to so the we can yeah. re re I don't know somehow reassign you. Um, assigned. In April, I will put you in room nineteen, and wait for somebody to join you. So maybe we put Anne. I uh, cannot find Anne in a, an, yes, an assigned. So Anne. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Anne will come back. Anne will come okay. back and we can mm -hmm. put Anne with the Carissa. What, what, what is her name? Um, Anne will come back in a moment. And then yes. we can put her with a person in room 16. Yeah. So this she is Anne. Is. Yeah, here she is. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you can assign her with a... Um, yes. the other person. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, now she's she's there. Okay. <sighs> okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Welcome back, everyone. Um, my hope is that you're feeling a bit more connected uh, on this virtual space. I see some some nods and thumbs up. That's great to see. <laughs> um, a few of us are new and perhaps just helpful for um, repetition sake as well. Uh, I wanted to repeat a few key uh, things about this session. One is a request that if you're feeling uh, yourself activated, freezing, panicking, enraged, that uh, that you take care of yourself, step away from the session or leave a breakout group you might be in, and that we respect each other's and celebrate each other's decision to do so. Um, that if you'd like to seek out uh, empathy support, uh, that might be helpful, whether it's someone uh, in your uh, personal uh, sphere or someone in this virtual space, and if you're willing to offer empathy, like you can add empathy angel to your name and people may reach out to you uh, directly. Um, again, we will have only limited opportunity for deep processing and what may be coming up for some of you really deserves deep processing, deserves uh, the right space and time to do that. Um, this platform doesn't, isn't, isn't that. 
Um, so I encourage you to find those spaces that are supportive for that kind of deprocessing here. Um, so now um, I've got some opening words. Um, I think, um, uh, as I'd mentioned before, uh, I, like many of you, have, have been seeking to make meaning uh, out of recent events in the world. Uh, and I'm grateful myself for this session as a way of pushing me to, to think and reflect and express um, many of the thoughts and feelings that have been whirling inside of me. Um, so here are a few um, a few words that I that I came up with um, that I thought would be helpful for us when we think about war. So it is with war that we punctuate our telling of history. War marks the beginning and end of eras, the cause and the effect of historical change to uh, historians. War is the birthplace of nations, the climax of national narratives, the makers of heroes and heroines, the setting for love stories, the driver of innovation, at once a profound source of unity and a profound source of division. While we seek for times of peace to prevail, it is wars that continually define and redefine us. Clausewitz said war is the continuation of policy with by other means. It is banal in the way that it reflects mundane political and social life in its unflagging reappearance throughout human history. War is extraordinary in the way in its scale of intentional harm the way it normalizes violence and atrocity. What is war? I think of war as large scale organized social violence. Older generations may think of war as the clash of state armies over territories and power, diplomatic power, military power. Yet the face of war has been changing and diversifying with new technologies, globalization and transnational threats. Of the 32 active armed conflicts today, right now, many of them involve asymmetric fighting with non-state actors who are motivated by ideology, identity, and lived social injustices. Their battlefields include urban areas and cyberspace. It's a different picture in many places. According to the UN, conflict and violence are on the rise higher than any time since World War II. The two attempts at international institutions, the League of Nations, the United Nations, uh, following each of the two world wars have failed their charge to prevent future wars. The promise that democracy and economic integration would be an end to war has rung hollow as even the integrity of democracy itself shows its fragility. Over 200, 38,000 people died in global conflicts just last year. While most of us immediately think of Russia and Ukraine, more people, over 100,000 people died in Ethiopia. Two billion people live in conflict-affected areas. And the 10 most of these affected areas lose on average nearly half of their GDP to conflict. Conflicts drive 80% of all humanitarian disasters, humanitarian crises and needs, including over 2 million starving children in Yemen and 14 million people displaced from Syria. In using the term war and armed conflict, we tend to bring the present direct and physical violence to the foreground. We may equalize the actors, and so as we proceed, let us not forget the forms of power beyond the physical and military that are at play. Let us remember the many complex systems operating quietly in the background and through time. These include the policies, institutions, and cultures that generate social division, inequitable access to resources, and human suffering. When systems of equitable governance and international cooperation break down, that's when politics continues as war. I wanna ask now for us to have some sharing of what comes up for you listening to these 
words that I've stitched together about war. Um, and I invite you to either type into the chat box or to raise your hand and then voice uh, uh, in uh, uh, voice to the rest of the group. Um, we're going to take about 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how alive this is, around this particular discussion before we move on. Goni, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank. I just wanted to know if um, participants can access the opening words that you just shared with us. I had a few requests around that. Mm. Sure. In the chat or... Yeah. Yeah, let me... <clears throat> Probably won't let me do all of it at once, so I'm going to put it in two or three bits. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also see Kamala raising her hand. Thank you. Okay. It looks like I need to put it into even smaller chunks. Is that coming through the first yeah. piece? Okay. All right. All right, I think that captures it. Yes, um, Kamala, is that? Yeah, um, thanks. And I'm so grateful to see you today and for you taking time for us, because it, it is um, a horrific time just across the board in the world. Um, I, I guess I had a little bit of, a, and, and I'm not trying to be po politically in one system or another, but when we talk about democracy as the way, um, it, it seems like um there may be other ways. I don't know what's right or wrong, um, but it seems like um, this need to dominate, um, at least in the United States where I'm from, um, and to wipe out anybody who doesn't agree with us. And I shouldn't use the word wipe out, but just to um, contest other people's right to um, follow whatever system works for them as long as it's not harming and we see that it harms everywhere. But I see that democracy harms also through its need to dominate. And um, and this war, I, it, I see all sides of it. I see, um, I see kind of every side has a reason for what they're doing and it, and it hurts. But I, I just feel like we need to put aside um, all our ideologies and try to see each other as human beings with basic human needs, which is why I practice NBC, you know, that um, everybody has a right. Well, nobody has a right, but everybody has a need for a safe home um, and food and housing. And I understand Hamas may feel that they've been left out of the table um, or that, um, people who believe in communism or socialism or any other system um, feel dismissed by superpowers that say our way is the only way. So I don't know. I, I'm not trying to be, I don't know. I'm just bringing this to the table as a, as a topic. I don't believe in one system or another. I try to stay out of the whole thing, but um, this separation that's going on, this enemy imaging, uh, I'm just really concerned and I wish that you could speak to that um, subject. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so at this point, folks uh, open to, to any kind of comments on, on what I had shared. Um, I would like to respond with a few thoughts to what uh, uh, Kamala has just shared with us. Um, 
there is a there was so I I studied international relations. Uh, this was almost two decades ago, and there was a, a reigning theory that uh, called the democratic peace theory that essentially um, democracy and growing. At that point, there was a notion that there was this blossoming trend towards de democracy throughout the world, um, with a few exceptions here and there that, that just needed to kind of get uh, pushed through, um, and that that democracy lent itself to 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 stable international orders, peaceful international order. Um, uh, the idea being that people don't want to fight, and if they vote for their politicians, they will vote for, for policy that avoids war. Um, I think my comments about democracy in there are more to show that that theory uh, hasn't held up. And even the very concept or principle of democracy has been very, has been challenged um, in, in, the, in, the, in the past decade. Uh, certainly not something that we can take for granted, let alone something that uh, we can expect to prevent war. Um, and <clears throat> I think um, another another reflection, uh, another another thought that comes up for me is um, the the ways in which um, our particular form of globalization and and economic globalization um, in many parts of the world um, uh, create, particularly for young people, um, create very isolated lives and environments. Um, so there there's there's some data that shows um, uh, for US soldiers, for example, returning from combat, that shows um, one, the rates of PTSD don't depend on how how immediately they were uh, exposed to direct violence. So in this counterintuitive sort of um, uh, phenomenon, folks who were in back offices doing civilian support um, have shown a similar rates of PTSD as folks who are on, on the battlefield. Other interesting da data shows that uh, folks in who are who have come back home in, from as U.S. soldiers here that there's lots of data on U.S. soldiers that I'm more aware of um, experience much higher PTSD um, than than for example uh, soldiers in the Israeli army um, uh, or than actually manifest while out in the field. Um, which lends to the last piece of data that's very telling, which is that um, during times of war, including the world wars, there are much less reported uh, mental health illnesses than during times of peace. So uh, fractions of uh, the rates of suicide, for example, than we see during times of peace. So this kind of data suggests that, that actually war is... Um, offers for some um, offers uh, an experience to be in the collective and have a purpose in a way that ordinary consumerist, isolated individualist lifestyles don't, particularly in the US. And so I think partly what we need to recognize is the failure of our social structures to meet some of these very important needs that uh, ironically and somewhat counterintuitively, war is able to meet um, a sense of togetherness, a sense of purpose that goes beyond the self, um, a sense of being fully engaged and in flow in, the, in a moment, however scary and dangerous that is. Um, these are some of the things that help people thrive and war offers an outlet that is disappearing in other places in, in social life as places of peace become places much more of greater social isolation where making money and income and lifestyle uh, instead of some kind of larger social purpose is the norm. Any, any more, any further comments, thoughts, questions? I'm, I'm checking out the comments here in the chat box as well.
Okay, you see, I'm, we also have a few hands, Tarek. Yeah. Four. Um, <laughs> let me lift up one of the chat box comments, and then I'll I'm, I'll come to you, Kristen and Roberta. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, um, so Barack Ogada says to me, I think war is a multi-billion business to major powers. During war, major powers test their newly manufactured weapons. They sell their old stocks to way, pave the way for new sophisticated weapons. As we lose lives and property as a result of war, the manufacturers of weapons become huge sales and pocket profits at the expense of human lives. Um, I think this is, uh, you know, my 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 sort of analysis of the world uh, from my studies and so forth would uh, uh, would affirm would align um, with this um, as one of the the major contributors, the forces that that push. Um, uh, countries and militaries into war. I think one of the things that I want us to think about uh, throughout this call are these um, large-scale structural dynamics that war offers us. NVC, uh, as we will come to talk about more, helps us uh, very much navigate uh, situations where we're in uh, with ourselves, with another person in a small group. When we're talking about war, we're talking about large groups uh, and institutions, and there are particular dynamics that come with those uh, those levels, uh, those scales, um, and that's that's a piece that we need to. That's a gap in the way that we approach conflict with NBC um, that that we need to be able to fill. Um, so one of that is how do you account for the institutional incentives? Uh, economic incentives that are out there for war, the political incentives that are out there for war, right? That that certain political actors have to gain. Um, and what, if any, role does NBC have in responding to those very real dynamics? Um, yeah, Roberta, Kristen. Yeah. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, uh, NBC Rising and Tarek, for this conversation. I've really been wanting this conversation for a while. I'm glad we're starting it. Um, I really appreciate what you said, Tarek, about looking at um, the, the needs, just using the N NBC frame, looking at the needs that war is meeting for the soldiers uh, and what we can learn from that in terms of uh, finding, creating societies that meet those same needs in other ways. And um, I worked for uh, 10 years with uh, American veterans of the Vietnam War on a writing project. Um, so this is a long time ago. And um, I was astonished whenever they re read what they wrote, it was always about how they formed the deepest friendships, uh, friendships that, you know, because they're high school students, you know, and, and that they went off to war and uh, found uh, experiences of trust with, with uh, other soldiers, lifelong friendships. Um, so I think that, that this is actually a place where NVC can contribute. Uh, and and link it uh, as you're suggesting, Tarek, to a, a larger vision of what we need to create in our societies. Um, and I think it will really help uh, in some of the NBC work uh, where we try to bring together uh, Israelis, Israeli Jews, and Palestinians, um, because it's really, really so hard for each group to understand why the other uh, participate in war. Uh, so thinking about these same needs being met. So it's it's almost like there's a, a really strange safety, right? Emotional safety that's created uh, that these otherwise fractured, turbulent, violent societies aren't uh, giving people. So I, I just think, thank you. This is a great discussion. Thanks, Roberta. Um, I see the next in the queue is a number, an 848 number. Would you like to join? 
I would. Can I be heard? Yes, we hear you. Hi, this is um, Lisa from New York. Hi, Tarek. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lisa. Um, I, um, I guess what comes up for me listening to all of this is that um, for many, maybe many here, maybe including me, uh, witnessing war is a form of entertainment. And I was thinking how entertainment, I mean, you could think the film industry doesn't always show things that feel good. People go to horror movies. Um, like situations where, where there maybe doesn't feel like a lot of deep meaning or a chance to see the meaning reflected upon others. I, I, um, I feel a little bit sad and I'm wondering like, could NBC be something that people wish to practice or wish to use because it benefits their life, even if it has no relevance for situations of war? Like, does it have to have relevance for people to want to engage? Maybe it's something people could engage in, even if it makes no difference for, um, for the types of political calculations or social, social conditions that cause, um, that cause leaders or groups to, to see war as the best calculus for their, for their interests or for, or for their larger social interests. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Jessica from Seattle. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, it's so wonderful hearing um, what you shared here, uh, Tarek. Um, I, uh, um, especially the part that you said war created this uh, sense of purpose and togetherness. I just, uh, I, I just, I attended a coaching event um, at the beginning of the month in Dallas, and there were 11,000 people uh, in the conference together. And uh, um, we actually did a lot of things that I would not be able to do on my own or even thought it was possible. So this uh, uh, physical togetherness holds such a power um, in you know, technology dominated, dominate, dominating society in the countries. And uh, um, yeah, I, I so appreciate um, raising this uh, um, important topic that we're losing each other's, you know, connection to, with each other's, but, you know, like we gain this autonomy, individual autonomy, and then it's in such a conflict. Um, yeah, and that actually helped me to uh, think about, you know, how in this in the integrating NVC maybe into our personal daily lives and to bring it into community and how we change our social culture um, to to build the sense of uh, purpose and togetherness and to be able to you know to influence the way that uh, more and more people wants to live because if we don't experience that uh, togetherness and it's not happening in our lives, um, we don't know what it's like. I mean, that event was great, but it's not everybody can go. And then, you know, it, it costs a lot of money. And then, it, you know, it's, it's a for a very particular purpose and for a very particular group of people. But wouldn't that be great if everyone can experience that kind of power and the understanding you know, how much we actually need with each other. So thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Naomi, in Berlin. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to say, I can, I can see your point that it's one of the needs and meets is having the, the shared experience and the community in, in that thing. 
But I do want to uh, add that during a time of war, people are so much in the act of being traumatized that, like you said, you know, I, I wanted to write it out in the comments, but I figured it'd be faster to say it. That if you say, you know, oh, people don't have so many mental health issues during war or, or after the Second World War, well, it's not something that's being that's being um, recorded so much. People are in the process of being traumatized. They're in survival mode. So the processing and all the damage doesn't get to be felt until afterwards, oftentimes. Also, as in the Second World War, where you have the whole generation that was so deeply traumatized, but it wasn't named as such because it wasn't it. There were so many people who, you know, killed themselves or had had so many issues, but it was never spoken of in the context of mental health. And so I think that's a that's a bit of a bias of what is being recorded and what's actually happening. And it's not like you can get a therapist in the middle of a war easily. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, let me, um, before we take a few more comments here, um, let me offer a reference uh, for folks, because uh, I see there there's some uh, traffic here around the this, this question of PTSD and data and, and those things. So um, a book I recommend is, is uh, by Sebastian Junger uh, called Tribe. Um, in this case, Tribe refers to um, actually uh, Tribe, in some places has a pejorative connotation. In, the, in this case, tribe refers to uh, the human collective that, that offers the kind of togetherness that Jessica was talking about um, and says that really the, the place in Western societies where you still find tribe is in the military. Um, and for that reason, um, the, the author who's a longtime war journalist, so not a military person himself, but has uh, has spent significant time in Afghanistan and Iraq um, next to um, soldiers uh, with and who is looking at all these data um, and talks about it in the book is that uh, is that he saw this as tribe in the good sense in the in the sense of something that fulfills satisfies that deep longing for for connection for togetherness and for purpose um, and uh, and in a way that isn't satisfied when you're not at war. Um, so I, I leave you with that book. To, it's a it's a quick read um, to get to get more deep into that uh, into that topic. Let's hear from Julie now. Hi. Um, yeah. So for me, it's th this whole thing about. Um, purpose outside oneself and togetherness and being fully engaged that comes with war, I have this wish that that could be possible around climate change and the ecological disaster, because I think that could, if only we could find a way, could pull us all together with a common, that kind of flight or fight type thing, because we're going to be coming to that. We are there for some people. Um, yeah, could pull us together with a common purpose that could supersede wars and and everything else. That's all. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I'm really I'm enjoying your Julie, your uh, shifting the the place in which we can experience connection and purpose to uh, a collective global. Uh, challenge that uh, we could all rally around uh, in solidarity with everyone uh, that shares this planet. Um, and I think partly, you know, if, if there's anything to take away from this conversation, it's that how can we create meaningful, purposeful, connected opportunities for people to engage with um, beyond the sort of competitive lifestyles that our existing political and economic systems push us into, right? Where can we feel tribe, um, but in a constructive sense that, that doesn't involve violence? Like, where can we build tribe in that sense? Amira, uh, sorry, Amina. Hi. I wanted to say that my dad was a World War II veteran, and... Um, I don't think he ever healed from being in the war. 
and it wasn't something that outwardly upset him. He tried to keep the war alive. And um, a friend of mine who was in Vietnam said, ah, yes, it gave him purpose. And he lived with that adrenaline as a young man. And so I grew up in a house. I asked him once about how many guns do you think you have in your collection? And he said at that time about 300. And that was only a small portion of the um, grenades. You always knew you didn't touch that one because it was live. And what he called memorabilia, that was part of his effort to keep the war alive inside of him. And there was no way for people to name the trauma. I mean, that as a child, you grow up with the wallpaper. It was part of our lives. And in a sense, the gift of that was it taught me about compassion, that nobody really wins in a war, no matter what side you're on. So, um, but it took me a long time in my life to put that together. And I remember speaking with a, um, someone whose father was in the same unit my father was in. Um, and he said, yes, his father came home from the war and like other veterans, nobody talked about their experiences. I just don't think there was a way, particularly for men, to talk about those deeper feelings of, of the great trauma and fear that they went through. So I just wanted to give that a name. Yeah. Mm. So, thank you. Amina. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's almost this very stark transition from uh being in um within a battalion within a group within a tribe um connected together and then all of a sudden coming back into a society uh yeah. that might even reject you for what you have done um and where uh particularly during the anti-war movement where soldiers found themselves in a space uh where they it wasn't even that they weren't understood. People didn't even want to understand them. Um, and I think part of what the data that Junger points to suggests is that it's in that context that PTSD is highest, not necessarily related to how severe the violence they witnessed, but it's that how what did they integrate back into, if they mm -hmm. integrated at all when they returned, that determined more than anything the rates of PTSD that they they were to experience. Again, that's the author's contention based on the data that, that he presents. Um, mm. All right, let's take one more comment. Uh, where we started, we'll come back to Kam uh, Kamala. Is that, am, am I? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Kamala. I was just going to say, um, I read a book some years ago, which may be of interest um, regarding PTSD. I forget the name of the author, but it's called The Theater of War, and it's a brilliant uh, concept that's become proliferated um, of reenacting Greek tragedies for soldiers and generals and people who have been through war. And they say that, you know, this this trauma, this um, what people come back from who have fought is universal and it's gone on for centuries and centuries. And so when they have a chance to play parts in these theatrical presentations, they receive healing in a way that they don't otherwise. And I was fascinated and heartened by that. So I don't, I wish I could remember the name, but I think the book is called The Theater of War. And it's it's a brilliant idea that's working. So hmm. Hmm. thank you for that. There are, I think, lovely little gems that are being dropped all throughout this conversation. I I I, I want to, yeah, I want to acknowledge lots is going on in the, in the chat here. Uh, thank you everyone for sharing. There's a bit too much than that, then I can keep track of and cover all. Um, certainly very important is the question of trauma and how trauma lives in the body and then how it manifests uh, over time. Um, uh, there was, uh, th there was a, a quick note here about psychedelics and there's all kinds of research uh, in growing uh, movement behind the use of psychedelics up to the point even that um, uh, some people believe that psychedelics are sort of this co-evolved uh, companion 
to to human existence that that psychedelics are what allow humans to find um uh to find relief from trauma and they exist in the natural environment and have exist in a sort of harmonious uh environment amongst indigenous people for uh for for time immemorial so uh uh those are all things that that are quite quite recent understandings discoveries theories that are coming up um I also want to mention that uh, insofar as we're talking about tribe, um, you know, the, the, the dark side or the shadow side of, tr of tribe and tribalism, as we've come to know it, which is a, a term that's come up a lot around the polarized political um, uh, uh, world we find ourselves certainly is, uh, is, that, is that at the, at the outgroup, the, the, the boundary of tribe, right, um, we find the capacity, the human capacity to completely ignore, erase, overlook uh, those who are not within the tribe. And that itself seems to have very, uh, we've, we seem to have a very strong neuropsychological disposition to that as well. So uh, incredible capacity for um, sharing, for giving, um, for supporting within uh, that boundary. And that boundary is fully you know, constructed imaginary um, falls along all kinds of lines of race, ethnicity, and religion, but can be very flexible and malleable. Although some scientists wonder about this, the degree to which that boundary can be expanded outwards, you know, to other species and so forth. But the moment you step over that boundary, neuropsychologically, we find we have, we have a, a, our, our brain has different, uh, whole different competitive circuits that light up, uh, uh, that, that no longer regulate or enable our ability to hold empath empathy and and perspective taking that on the other hand uh do you know what marshall rosenberg talks about as the alienating forms of communication and relating um the blaming uh the judging the disconnecting from our own sense uh, uh of contribution um so uh so that that is a part of this idea of tribe that we need to grapple with how can we both create tribe in its beautiful sense, in its connecting sense, um, but what we do with the boundaries of 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 tribe, the othering that it, that is implicit in the in the notion of of tribe itself? I'd like to now um, set up uh, some pair share uh, breakout groups, uh, or ask Army to do so, and. Um, for this particular breakout group, um, I'm going to ask you to talk about um, how you have been personally impacted by war. It's an open-ended question, um, and you know you're welcome to talk about any part of that question uh, that you're comfortable doing so uh, with the, with your partner. Um, and there's a second piece to the question, which is how has war that you're not directly in right? So to differentiate the people, I'm assuming most of the people on this car, on this call, are not in basic survival mode that war puts the most direct participants into. Um, but even not being directly inside of a war, inside a war zone, how has it introduced conflict in your own life, right? So two questions, how has war personally impacted you? And two, how has it introduced conflicts within your life? How has war introduced conflicts within your own life? Um, so those are the questions. And I want to remind you that if um, at any point in time you are encouraged to leave breakout groups, if you're not finding that it's a constructive space or if you're activated around what's being said or spoken and for us to honor other people's choices to do so. And you'll have uh, 10 minutes to discuss those two questions, um, which I will put into the chat box as well. Mark, I wonder if adding one, two, or three extra minutes will be supportive as I hear the questions. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm wondering if a little bit more time could. Oh, how about how about 12 minutes? Maybe, it's, if, if it's still possible for ARMY to, uh, have, yeah. OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's see.
So we're ready with the breakout room? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lunch. I'm opening now. Mm -hmm. okay. hmm. Just checking in, are you okay? Do you need anything from me? Um, just to say that I, I am following the chat, but uh, wait, let's see. We'll come back, everyone. Welcome, welcome back. <clears throat> All right, so we had a uh, breakout groups um, offering the opportunity to share what uh, some of your personal experiences uh, impacts with uh with war and so i want to i want to allow for uh some people to name as some examples of what they shared i ask you not to share something that someone else has told you so that they uh can remain maintain control over the level of privacy over that information but that you just speak to something you might have shared i'd love to hear maybe four or five examples of ways that um, people have been impacted and how conflict has it has uh, flowed or rippled from a large-scale war how, how that has introduced conflict in your own life I'm going to begin, um, and it's totally fine that if no one would like to share on those questions in the large group, I just I like would to... like to share. Okay, I'll start off with with something that I'm witnessing, and then I think that was you, Diane. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So one of the ways that I've seen, you know, and I'm so I'm currently in the United States, um, and so uh, in terms of the the escalation of violence that has occurred in the Middle East, um, one of the interesting places that I've seen it appear in my own life is actually uh, on university campuses. Um, I do a significant amount of work with different universities, particularly around restorative justice work, uh, offering alternatives um, to uh, kind of punitive responses, including uh, for cases of sexual harm on university campuses. And I've had many of my colleagues uh, at, at uh, about almost a dozen different universities um, who've reached out because they're seeing how much um, what they say is their campuses have um, uh, have caught on fire. Um, so there's certainly demonstrations and postering and flyering, but uh, even more shocking and worrying is death threats um, and an actual physical violence between students, student groups, in some cases also with involving faculty. Um, so you can see uh, how the, the intense emotions from witnessing a conflict that some of the students may be directly connected to um, have manifested in even a far off university campus. All right, any, Diane? Yes, um, thank you. The, I'm not directly, I live in the US and I don't have friends or relatives in Israel or Gaza, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm not directly involved in that sense, but it's produced an inner conflict in me in that um, a 
person I know here in my town that I have great respect for and heart connection with, um, attended a demonstration, political demonstration around this war. And the demonstration he attended was not the one I would have anticipated he would. And one that uh, brings up in me a sense of, well, not being in agreement with that one. And so now I notice I have an internal conflict about um, him, about my thoughts about him, my feelings, the feelings that come up and... Uh, I haven't said anything. I'm not going to say anything, but I am sad that this is coming up in me because it. I notice I pull back from him, uh, a distancing, a disconnect from him, and I'm sad about that. Hmm. That's my share. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. So uh, you may not be alone in in being mm -hmm. here and finding that this is related, that this is strained relationships that you have with mm -hmm. people um, who find have different perspectives, opinions about what's happening, and mm -hmm. um, because of its, you know, the more that this issue comes is, is something you're passionate about, is something that um, invokes uh, incredible amounts of care and worry and fear. Um, possibly the more difficult it is to engage with people who, who come from different perspectives on this. So let's hear from uh, Karen. Hi. <clears throat> um, my dad was a child during World War II and he was uh, in Ostpreußen, <laughs> East Prussia, mm -hmm. and uh, he had to flee, and he was a refugee, and he came to Germany, and he had troubles to integrate. He wasn't welcomed with open arms by the people who were where they who had grown up where they were, and this kind of. I think it's kind of in my cells as well. And I have difficulties believing that I'm integrated or that people want to integrate me. Um, and so I think I've kind of inherited his trauma. That was my, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, again, I, I don't imagine you're alone in, um, being the child uh, in a lineage of people who have uh, directly experienced war and um, and how that has impacted you epigenetically or through you, the stories and the or not telling the stories the silence that you you may have experienced at times um, let alone the way that people who have been in through war may have, uh, you know, acted around you, raised you, or had the capacity to treat you differently because of the experience of being in war. Jessica. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I uh, I want to say this, uh, I want to share this one thing that um, I've been I've been working on, I've been writing a book about uh, uh, the U.S. public school system so what you said at Tarek was happening in the college, I see the par I see it in parallel in our public school system. So I'm a parent in the public school system. Um, I saw the uh, conflicts has been escalating for the past decades between the teachers and the administration. I mean, for, for many people that who are not familiar with the, the US public school system, the teachers are belong to one organization and the principal belongs to the uh, school administration uh, in the system. So they're, they're, they don't belong to the same organization. 
and the, the conflicts has been escalating um, to the point where parents decided, you know, affected the students and the, the parent families that the parents have decided to take the children out. So that's one of the main reason that uh, um, one of the main reasons that our public school system enrollment has been declining. So this year in our district, district in our school district, that the district is planning to closing down 15 schools um, alone alone in our district. So I also see this is a micro reflection of what's happening in our society um, of the conflict in how we are not be able to reconcile with each other and uh, um, you know, slowly move away from what the school system was set out to do from the start. So thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning that and thank you for hearing me out. Thank you for that, Jessica. I'm, and I'm just thinking about the ways that um, larger social conflicts are rippling into school systems. I'm thinking about the way that during the US elections, which was incredibly polarized um, the last time around, the fear that students had that even in elementary schools the kind of distress that was being registered by social workers and schools. Um, I'm thinking about climate angst that runs high, uh, particularly in high schools, as well as the fear of gun shootings. Again, a, 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 a not totally unique, but a fairly unique phenomenon in the United States of mass shootings. But I'm sure uh, other kinds of stressors are alive in many other school systems around the world. Roberta? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, again, uh, this is such, uh, it just feels like a really important inquiry for me right now to look at, you know, again, look, because I live in the US, really look at how is particularly uh, for me, the war in the Middle East right now spilling over. Um, because all of the effects, I think that is war. And I think that something again that you know nbc can contribute because we can hold i think with safety some of these really probing discussions right is you know well what is war what are all the effects of it and and then that will help us decide if it's an effective strategy for meeting the needs that people think it's meeting and um one thing that uh, really came up for me in listening is uh, it's it's the question for me is really what um, how does the uh, how does violence affect my um, capacity to uh, hold steady in conflict? So uh, as a child, I suffered a lot of violence in my family, and I see that uh, that has you know so deeply affected. Uh, my aversion to conflict, running away from it, numbing out, trying to make nice and, you know, rather than being able to see conflict is is absolutely um, an, an engine for transformation and progress. So, you know, war, what war does is, is it makes us afraid of conflict. So then we're stagnant. Uh, so and, you know, there's a lot to that. But that was what came up for me pretty strongly. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Roberta. I, I, I love this idea that when we're talking about war, maybe we broaden our lens from just an image of a battlefield. Uh, you know, we broaden it out to every single home, school, and so forth, where the ripples of conflict uh, might pass, whether they be emotional, psychological, right? Um, even now to the way that conflict uh, affects the supply of, you know, for, for example, in Ukraine, the supply of phosphorus, which has led to major shortages of food in Africa. Um, mm. um, because that's a fertilizer that's, that's needed um, to sustain large mm. amounts of people. So uh, yeah, I'm loving this notion of, of looking, taking a wide net at understanding 
the comprehensive effects uh, that war might have. Um, and I think vice versa, a comprehensive approach at seeing what contributes to wars um, uh, occurring as well. I'd like to ask, let's, I'd like to now shift into this, to, to the question of NBC more specifically. And, and so with having in mind the ways that uh, war is showing up, um, again, I assume most of us on this call are not in the middle of an active war zone. Um, uh, you know, we are not calling from Gaza or uh, <clears throat> places in Western Cameroon, uh, for example. We're uh, we're likely calling with some degree of stability in our immediate personal lives, um, and yet we've just talked about the way that war ripples out and introduces conflicts and stresses in our personal lives. So. So let's talk a little bit about how does NVC serve us um, from in that kind of position. So, and I'd love to hear anything people want to say or to read whatever you have to type on that. What are some ways that you have been able to benefit from NVC uh, in the way that war is showing up in your own personal lives? And I, I encourage, you know, I encourage voices that may have even more direct experience with wars for sure to be, to be heard here. This is, I think we would all benefit from that. Uh, Sinta, is that right? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about my experience working with uh, NVC groups in Ukraine from 2015-16 onwards. Um, so there was quite a large group of people that had gone through our trainings uh, by the time uh, Russia invaded full scale uh, February last year. Um, and we have seen that one of the things that that's really served a lot it was the basic empathy skills. So being there uh, and learning to take care of your own resources. Yeah. Um, because, and this, this taking care of your own needs and taking care of yourself and making sure you're rested. And uh, the people who learned that they could uh, then be available for others to hold space. And that was really, really about empathic listening and, and returning people there. Uh, yeah, to their connection with themselves. Um, and and of course, we had a lot of talk about protective use of force and, and uh, where that applies. And that was in a way kind of easy in that case, uh, in this war, because it's so very clear there's uh, an aggressor side and a side defending itself. And then within that defending, there's all the nuances of where is it still protective use of force? Where is it the minimum possible? Um, and that's, of course, where the discussion then is. But we have two of the people we trained are working with army units, doing NVC, having need cards on the floor and keeping them connected to, to, to their purpose and to what now what they're doing and what they're doing it for and trying to keep them connected to that humanity. And uh, yeah, so there's lots of stories to share around that, but I'll keep it at this one. Thank you. Wow, Sinta, I really appreciate you speaking that into the space. Um, so, I mean, just to, just to amplify what you said, uh, there are soldiers currently if I heard right, who are using empathy, the practices of empathy that learn that they learned prior uh, to the invasion of Ukraine, um, in order to have deep conversations, uh, reflections about uh, what they're doing, uh, um, what consists, what is protective, what is not, in order to uh, continue to hold people on a basic level with empathy. 
um, in order to maintain connection to their own to their own purpose and in what they're doing. Is that is that right? Yes, I think that the, the soldiers, this one group, and other people have been doing a lot of empathy for refugees and for people who lost loved ones, and so there's a whole empathy infrastructure that that grew out of this NPC community that supports lots of groups around the country. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm just loving that that phrase, empathy infrastructure, um, and I'm just imagining rallying around, you know, folks. Um, who have resources, emotional resources, to be able to provide them uh, to folks in vulnerable settings who don't. Um, I, I will amplify. I will sort of name uh, Roberta's efforts and and some of our friends to provide similar infrastructure for Palestinians um, and, and Israelis uh, around what's happening in the Middle East. Um, I think I think that's very meaningful work to be doing, and it points to. Uh, one of the, the ways that NBC uh, serves us in times of war, um, and, and that is um, uh, to provide the kind of accompaniment emotionally that people need who are in times of distress. Uh, it, it helps build resilience. Uh, it may help to heal or process trauma. Um, it may help to keep people more functional in their daily lives. Um, because as war rages, we are still called uh, to feed our children, uh, to uh, pay bills, uh, to show up. We're still relied on. And so in a very real way, that kind of empathy, that processing helps us maintain our functionality um, as much as uh, we can. I've got a Zoom user with a hand up. Go ahead. Hi, that might be me. Hmm, yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just noticing some stuff moving in me to speak out, and I'm also not exactly sure it matches with your question. Maybe you could, or your prompt, maybe repeat it. Um, my my prompt was just to share out what you might have, uh, anything you might have come up for you during the pairs, uh, pair sharing. Um, so any ways that, uh, that um, I'm sorry, we had gone past that. We were talking about the ways that NVC might serve us in light of the way war shows up and personally impacts us. Ah, okay. I was feeling moved to share how, despite having studied MSC, NVC, I'm still really struggling with it in times of war. Is, is that okay to share that as well? Or would you like to? Yeah. Okay. Please, yeah. Um, I guess I'll just place myself. Um, I'm Australian, but I've been living in Israel, Palestine for the past seven years, and I'm temporarily in Berlin. I just the mental, I just felt too unsafe being there, so I'm temporarily here, but I do live there. Um, and I guess what I wanted to name is that coming, coming to spaces of conversation, um with people who are directly impacted you know i have friends whose children are serving in the army and um i don't have friends or most people in gaza and yet i do deeply value all life and so i hold all of it and coming to spaces of that and trying to bring empathy for humanists just to name how emotionally exhausting that is and how hard it is to stay present in those places without having someone almost directly next to you as a giraffe every moment resourcing you. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to name the distance between sitting in these really important spaces like we are now where we're speaking about this and also on the ground speaking about it as people directly impacted how hard that is. And I find it almost impossible. Yeah, and just a morning of like hopelessness. The other option is just to shut down and stay away. Um, yeah, I think that's what I have to say. I just wanted to be heard and how hard it is. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. So, 
I, I think we, I think we're we're coming upon a notion here that uh, simultaneously, um, this practice um, and this way of being that we know as NVC um, can have incredible benefits for us to be able to support others immediately around us, for us to be able to um, be there and con connect with ourselves through intense uh, times of turmoil. Um, that, and that can even be uh, you know, expanded outwards to, to people who are really in need through building of empathy infrastructure. And at the same time, um, I think we're also a piece of this conversation needs to recognize how that doesn't stop the bombs from falling. Um, that that is a, a kind of humanitarian work that we may choose to do using empathy as the tools, the the evacuation, sort of um, metaphorically speaking, equipment that we have to bring people out of emotional places of distress, um, but that that those aren't things that stop the bombs from falling. Um, and we're aware that they continue to fall. We're aware of death tolls. We're aware of humanitarian crises that uh, continue even as we're providing this kind of humanitarian empathy uh, assistance. And the two might not at all be proportional, right? The creation, the generation of, of more destruction of more refugees might so overwhelm our ability to provide uh, just empathetic risk support to others. So I just wanna name the hugeness of that predicament um, for folks who are there who are wanting to give an offer, um, you know, that beauty, that gift of empathy to others, aware of how the war generates so much more than we can hold. Uh, Yana. Thank you, Tarek. This was really touching. <laughs> I, I want to let it sink for another moment. <sighs> and yeah, and I was coming a little bit from the other side because at the same time, I want to stretch also how, how helpful and important it can be to offer and support spaces for grieving and mourning um, I'm the first generation in my family born not in a war for I don't know how many decades or I don't know how long, but one effect that it really has on me or on our family until this day is how hard it is to handle grief, sadness, difficult emotions. Because when you are in survival mode, there is no space for grief. And yet it is so vital, so crucial for, for staying alive and staying connected with life and moving on through life and being creative in how to deal with life and um yeah, basically staying connected, as Sinta said, with your humanity with life and yeah, and I see there's a very big impact that NVC can have there to create those spaces for for just expressing grief and mourning, sadness and tears. And I also believe that, or from, from what I've learned, I'm quite convinced that there is a correlation between the growing violence and aggression and the inability of crying and shedding tears and mourning and grieving. So in an indirect way, I hope it would also help reducing violence in the future. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Yannick. Karen. All right, I'm nervous, but I'm gonna speak in oh thank you so so much um so i live in ohio 
Yay, Ohio. Um, so I've been an activist for many years, but really avoided politics until about three or four years ago. Um, and I am somebody who loves to study the infrastructure of, of systems. And then what I'm trying to say is I think there is a, um, we are a democracy that is looked to far and wide. And I, um, I think there's a tendency to want to turn away from that instead of uh, not turning away from it. And, and one thing I've recently um, become aware of is just how poorly paid state representatives are. For example, you know, in California, you can make $120,000 actually in my state, you can make a just barely livable wage, but in most states across the country, the people with so much power are not reflective of our democracy. And this is such, to me, just like, I'm afraid nobody's gonna listen to me. I mean, I just think that's kind of the root of the inconsistency and in, in how we see our electeds and how we prioritize using tax money to actually pay them a livable wage to me is it just brings me to my knees like if we can fix that we can start really strengthening uh, and becoming the reflective democracy aka the tribe the i anyway thank you for Thank you mm -hmm. for hearing me out. And thank you for this uh, venue. This is mm -hmm. really moving. Thank you, Karen. So um, noticing time, um, I'm going to say maybe Roberta will be our last uh, comment. I have a few things that I hope, I mean, I hope to sort of gather various loose threads and bring them together into some closing for us. Um, um, and I know much will will be left unclosed, and that I you know urge you to take out into the world, continue reflecting and connecting with others around. Roberta. Thanks. Um, and uh, thank you, Karen, as always can be counted on to uh, show us other aspects of systemic problems. Um, Something else I was thinking uh, from what the person who spoke before Karen shared about how NBC helps me and I think can help us uh, show up uh, in war situations is that, you know, part of our training is to learn how to hear no, right? Uh, and, 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 I think the maybe the one of the secret superpowers of NBC is when someone says no, they're not saying no to to our needs. They're not saying no to our need for survival, our need for safety, our need for respect, for dignity, for love. It's just the strategy that they hear us promoting is a strategy that they fear will uh, stop them from meeting their needs. Uh, so I think you know there's all kinds of skill sets. Uh, that NBC can bring. And and I've been like racking my brains. How do we get it into the nego the world of the negotiators? Because we've been seeing for a few weeks now, actually some of the, uh, I know people who've been involved in some of the negotiations and they send their email, they, they actually publish their email threads with Hamas. And I'm like, oh my God, can we get some NBC to these people? <laughs> uh, so in exactly the kinds of skill sets we're talking about, th these are needed at the highest levels, I, I think. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberta. All right, so as we enter the, the final stretch here of our time together, um, I wanna celebrate all the rich discussion. Um, thank you for all the sharings. Uh, I think in this last uh, set of sharings, we've heard a number of ways that NVC is serving um, people to to respond in times of war in ways that that are meaningful, uh, that provide for some movement and hope. Um, so 
you know, everything from building that empathetic, uh, that infrastructure of empathy um, for those who might be most vulnerable um, to uh, encouraging, supporting ourselves, our families, our workplaces, our schools um, uh, to, to counteract, to build that resilience, to be able to sustain uh, the stressors that war um, sends out in all directions. Um, there are there are people out there who are in positions where they are able to negotiate or they're able to make decisions. Um, and you know, for those people, NVC will certainly gives them a tool, both a tool of understanding, you know, analyzing where is this conflict going from, what is this so called enemy really wanting underneath it all. And what are some creative ways of providing that without um, compromising one's own needs? Um, uh, creating spaces for people who've been directly affected to work and process trauma um, in ways that allow the breaking of cycles of trauma. Um, and what I what I want to add to all of this is, of course, um, if you're not someone who is in the negotiating room over a a, a peace process, or someone who is, uh, you know, holding the levers that fund wars that are happening, or making the direct decisions to enter into wars or how those wars are conducting, which I assume most of us are not in those categories of people. Um, some of the limitations I think of NVC and of us um, of thinking in terms of NVC is that we may find ourselves only turning towards empathy, uh, only turning towards that as the thing that we can do. Again, I, I'm not, I don't wish to minimize the importance of that, um, but, in terms of what people, in terms of what will change wars and the infrastructure of war itself, um, we need tools of social change that include, um, you know, nonviolent activism. And I want to leave you with a particular resource um, that informs my thinking around the relationship of NBC and nonviolent activism, although NBC is not named in the document once. Um, it's a guide called the Synergizing Nonviolent Action and Peacebuilding Guide that's put out by the US Institute of Peace. Um, and it offers the following basic premise. It says throughout history, um, all of the major social movements, and we've seen from research that nonviolent social movements are twice as likely to achieve their goals than violent social movements. Uh, largely, that can be explained by the fact that more people are willing to enter nonviolent social movements than they are to enter violent social movements. They're, they're more willing to participate if their lives are not directly at stake. There's also a moral component. People, it's aligned with more people's values. There's also a gender component to it, people. More women are willing to, to enter into nonviolent campaigns and the more willing, women there are in a nonviolent campaign, um, it directly correlated to the success of those campaigns. And the premise, again, of this, this guide is that um, in order to make social change effective, in order to have this, you need to have both the architecture of nonviolent movements, right? So that's everything from the civil disobedience that disrupts systems uh, to the mass education or awareness raising that makes things, dramatizes issues the way that Martin Luther King would call it. Um, but need to, those need to be interwoven with the peace building tools, the ability to, to talk, to have empathy, to take perspective. And that's not necessarily because you're going to be able to dialogue through the so-called enemy. It's first and foremost important so that you can have an effective uh, movement. Many of our current movements around the globe, and there are many of them, whether it's dealing with racism, it's dealing with climate issues, are plagued by internal fraction, the inability in the face of really big issues to work together. And it's 
And it's in those places where NVC and peace building tools in general are essential in order for nonviolent movements, whether they're to stop war or racism or climate change, um, need, to, need to be integrated. Um, so I leave you with that. I, I will put the name of the, actually I'll put the link to the guide in the chat in just a, an, a second. I want you to, to zoom out and I want you to think about the fact that uh, ending bombs is really a social movement um, because of all of the economic, social, and political forces that need to be changed. A social movement takes many people working together across uh, divisions um, and up against power structures. And social movements that are nonviolent have been able to do that more effectively, but they need to be able to be, to work together well and to use the tools of peace building in addition to the tools of activism. And so, and, and so that's where the, the very important role of NBC is. Um, thank you everyone for your, your time and attention. Um, thank you everyone for caring enough to be here on a Saturday. Um, I hope um, this has been valuable for you. I'm gonna put the, that last reference here in the chat box. Feel free to put any uh, parting words into the chat box, and I hope you all have a beautiful weekend. Stay safe. Tarek, I would like to thank you um, for leading us through this session today. Um, hmm, very meaningful to hear these words amidst the, the experience of living in Israel and Palestine at the moment. And I was also, as someone already mentioned in the chat, it was very meaningful for you that you voiced and you gave space for many other conflicts that are alive now in the world and um, for many years um, are not as heard of as specifically um, the war that is now taking place in Israel-Palestine. So also just want to acknowledge that and thank you for doing so. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I would like to say once again that um, this session hosted by us uh, at NBC Rising and led by Tarek um, is part of a series of free events that we've been um, hosting in the past two months. We have another event coming up this Tuesday called Embodied Empathy. I welcome you to join it as well. And um, these events are leading to the opening of our year program that is called the Learning Community. And um, maybe what I take away from um, you, Tarek, from what you shared with us um, is that creating spaces for connection, togetherness, and meaning is some sort of uh, um, um, taking an active step towards uh, potentially preventing more war and more violence to happen in this world. So I, I welcome you to join us in this program and I will be staying here for a few minutes in case you wanna hear more about it. I put the link in the chat and I welcome you to invite more of your circles and your networks to check it out because this is what we do at NVC Rising. Um, in order to create an alternative for violence. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And welcoming you to say goodbye in a way that is meaningful for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and thank welcoming you, those, those of you who would like to stay for a few minutes, I'm around. I'd also like to thank ARMY, uh, that was uh, doing all the tech for today. Thank you, Army, for being here, for supporting us. Um, yeah, and have a have a peaceful <laughs> day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Goni and NVC Rising for hosting Tarek. Mm -hmm.
this really nourishing conversation. Thank you for your consistency. Mm. Thank you, Anna. Hi, Goni. Just wanted to send my love. Mwah. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. Mm. So I guess slowly, slowly, um, people are leaving and perhaps in a few moments we will see who is around here to hear more about our learning community um yeah maybe i will start uh, to share now <laughs> feel free to leave if you are not here to hear more about it um so i will probably take um another 10 or 15 minutes in case people are interested to hear more about it um, so the learning community is a program that will open in about six, yeah, six days from now on December 2nd. It's going to be the third time we will be opening it. And uh, we are inviting inviting people from around the globe um, to be part of a learning journey that take, take, takes place for 10 months. Um, and yeah. Um, we offer through these 10 months a variety of sessions, what we call trainer sessions, what we call community sessions, what we call empathy cafes, conflict cafes. Um, we have two other um, way of um, building community that we call home groups and empathy buddies. So home groups are small groups within the larger community. Um, where people are assigned to and they spend the entire year with the same group, um, creating more bond, more intimacy, more trust, um, and the possibility to share in a, in a smaller, um, more familiar um, um, environment. Um, as well as empathy buddies, which is some sort of a practice that we we offer people to to join uh, each month or month and a half. You will be allocated if, if you wish um, or matched with another empathy buddy to simply practice the exchange of empathy, giving and receiving empathy. And um, you could read all, all about it in our in our website. I might put a schedule link, but um, yeah, what I would like to maybe emphasize that this is really our, yeah, this is really our way to be um, creating somehow what we call the compassionate revolution. Um, this is our way of um, bringing or creating spaces in the world that are um, diverse and inclusive, that are accessible for, for many, many, many people. Um, around the globe, and for us, it has been an amazing experience to to build the global community that we have been building for the past uh, three and a half years. Um, yes, yeah, so I I welcome you if you would like to uh, ask specific or direct questions about it. Um, the space is open, and I will also put in the chat. The schedule, there is so much more to say about it, but um, I don't want to overload you also with information. Um, so yeah, if you if you have a specific question, uh, please feel free to ask. Goni, I just want to say, I can't stay on for very long. I, yes, I'm, really, I'm really tempted to do this. I feel great admiration for your work. Just incredible admiration that you're continuing it, doing mm -hmm. so much that's relevant for people right now in this time when you yourself are in the midst of a war. Um, it's really incredible to me. And um, I'm just concerned about the time, which is the only, the main reason that I'm not... Um, I'm doing a lot of NBC in my community right now, and I'm I'm just concerned about the time commitment. So, um, thank you, thank you, Janet. 